Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Demands are mounting for the release of the Wall Street Journal reporter and New Jersey native detained in Russia. It's been one week since Evan Gershkovich, who grew up in Princeton, was taken into custody by Russia's Federal Security Bureau while reporting on a story for the outlet and accused of spying for the U.S. government. It's an allegation the Wall Street Journal vehemently denies. Now, a Moscow court says it's agreed to hear an appeal on April 18th from Gershkovich lawyers. The court could uphold the detention, move him to another jail, or grant bail. It's the first time Russia has brought a spy case against a U.S. reporter since the Cold War, a sign of escalating tensions between Russia and the U.S. amid the war in Ukraine. President Biden has demanded his immediate release, and earlier today, more than 200 Russian journalists and activists signed an open letter calling for Gershkovich to be made free. His friends and family are actively doing their part. I'm now joined by Jeremy Burke, a close friend of Evans from college and former roommate. Jeremy, uh, it's really great to get a chance to talk to you. Clearly, Evan uh, was drawn to Russia, um, not just from the sense of uh, his family, but he had a real desire to understand this other side of the country that so few of us know. Uh, tell me about why someone would leave uh, here in America where there are a lot of opportunities as a journalist um, to follow this real passion. So first and foremost, thank you for having me on and, and thank you for your time and attention to Evan's case. Evan, as a fluent Russian speaker, he grew up the parent of Soviet Jewish emigres. He felt a calling to go to Russia and to tell the story of Russian people. He left the U.S., he left New York in 2017. And at the time, the Russian economy was changing. There was a lot going on in the country. And he felt like he could be the person to really bridge the gap between what Western audiences needed to know and the stories that Russian people wanted told. Evan fell in love with the country. He loves Russia. He loves Russian people. And all he wanted to do was share that knowledge with the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, that's evident in his work. What kind of journalist was Evan? What type of stories did he want to tell beyond wanting to desperately hold on to this culture? Evan was had a wide range of reporting skills. He first left the, left the U.S. to report on Russia's economy. He reported on business and finance as well. Um, after that, he dove into my sort of favorite aspect of his reporting, the culture stories. He really lived in Russia, in Moscow, as a Muscovite. He, he knew all the cool bars, cafes, restaurants, DJs, and everything. And he reported about the nightlife and the regular life of, of 20s, you know, people in their 20s and 30s in Russia as well. Um, after the war broke out, Evan's reporting changed. He actually was one of the first reporters to break the story that... Uh, Wounded Russian soldiers are being transported across the border to Belarus, and, and Belarus is helping Russia with the war effort. But perhaps my favorite story that Evan wrote uh, was at the height of the war, which is obviously still ongoing. He traveled back to Moscow to report from those cafes, restaurants, bars, and clubs that he loved to talk about what this war was like for regular Russian people and how things had changed or had not changed within the country. And that was for me, illuminating reporting, and it spoke exactly to what Evan's priorities are and the type of person that he is. Yeah, well, he obviously had a window into this life there that so few of us get an opportunity to see. He was really about decoding sort of the Russian life. Yeah, I mean, in all of the work of his that, that I've um, had the opportunity to read, it seems like he had a real understanding of it. Absolutely. And, and you know, as the child of, of Soviet immigrants. He was very fluent in the language, but not only that, he was fluent in the culture and how things work in Russia. So I think that gave him a really good landing pad to tell these stories in a way that were 
useful to Western audiences, right? People like myself, who frankly had very little understanding about what Russia was like, and he really humanized that element. And I think his love of Russia and the Russian people really came across in his reporting, and it made me almost fall in love with the country vicariously through him. I wonder, you know, given the fact that he knows so well uh, the inner workings uh, of, of Russia, the government, does that perhaps make him better prepared for what he is facing, for what lies ahead for him? He, he was not naive, to say the least. Um, he knew exactly what he was doing. He, he was used to being tailed by the FSB. You know, there's a lot of the Wall Street Journal had set up a lot of security considerations around his reporting trips. Uh, however, I, I don't think this was expected. Um, I think he thought he might be expelled from the country uh, to be detained in, in a high profile hostage situation. I, I don't I, I don't know. There has been just an incredible marshalling of resources to try and help him and try and help the situation. But given the complexity of it and given, you know, that there are only so few people in the world who can actually impact the situation, we're doing what we can to just keep his name out there and keep pressure on the situation to ensure his safe return home. Yeah, um, we're thinking of all of you right now, of course, Evan. Uh, Jeremy Burke, thank you so much. Thank you again for your time. Meanwhile, there's been a greater effort here in the state to help those getting back on their feet after serving time in prison by helping the formerly incarcerated find employment and gain the skills they need to land a good paying job upon release. As Ted Goldberg reports, it's a key factor in keeping those individuals from reoffending. Reentry started behind the wall, you know, accepting responsibility for the crime that I committed in society, paying my debt for it. I'm paid up. Now it's time for me to, you know, get my life together, enjoy life. New Jersey Reentry Corporation's annual conference was a celebration of people who are now putting prison behind them. Ex-felons like Ulysses McMullen said having a job plays a big factor in straightening out his life. I've gotten a few trades. I work nights. That's why I'm a little tired. Candido, how many years behind the wall? I was 28 years. When I get my first restaurant, it will sell only six plates a day. And then I start working hard the way they're supposed to be. And today I sell 300 plays a day. People spoke at length about the need for formerly incarcerated folks to get a job even before they're released and hold on to it after they get out. Anthony DeFrisco was behind bars after a murder conviction in 1987, but then turned state's witness, which allowed him that opportunity. They let me come out a couple hours a day and work, and I felt good about that. Gave me something to do, focus my time, my energy. I'd be the one delivering the news to them that, you know, great news, you passed the GED. And some of them would give me a high five or a fist bump. And sometimes, you know, this would be a grown man just dissolve in tears and, and fall into my arms at the thought that they had passed the GED. And, you know, honestly, I was making 37 cents an hour doing that job. And it could have been 37 cents an hour, it could have been $37 an hour, it could have been $3,700 a week. It, doesn't matter. It has to start behind the wall. I mean, the reality is we have to start preparing men and women behind the wall for productive life, and we can't waste years of waste, wasted time, no access to computers, no access to services. To Frisco says getting a job after getting out was far from easy. People don't do background checks anymore. They just Google you, and they don't even tell you. So you have, I have great interviews and great this and great that, and we're so happy to help you. And then they Google me. And then they say, yes, we do hire ex-felons, just not all ex-felons. People were told when to go to work, I mean, when to, when to eat, when to go to every little function. And so people didn't have the ability to make decisions. NJ Reentry Corporation Chairman Jim McGreevy welcomed a wide variety of speakers to Jersey City today pastors and politicians praising his efforts and the program in general. If we're not going to be serious about helping individuals re-enter society, have dignity, have a purpose, have a job, then we are going to be in this never-ending cycle of recidivism. We're trying to make sure that dignity is restored and that an individual has an opportunity to provide for their families and their loved ones. Statistics don't lie. I mean, New Jersey gets a rap bad rap for a lot of things. I will tell you that in New Jersey, the national recidivism rate is like 70%. New Jersey is 33. So I think that speaks volumes as to the programs that 
we do have. NJ Reentry Corporation offers job training across 16 different programs, including construction and green energy, giving those who served the tools to succeed. In Jersey City, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. The state attorney general's office is finally sharing more details on the takeover of Patterson's police department just over a week ago. According to Attorney General Matt Platkin, officers are undergoing training in patrol techniques, which includes what the office calls constitutional policing and other best practices. Now, some of the changes will be visible to the community, like equipping more officers with tasers and updating the department's website and social media accounts to share more information with the public. Others won't be for operational reasons. The state says the team overseeing the changes are already meeting with leaders in the community to get them engaged, but the process won't change overnight. Governor Murphy this week sent a strong message to the LGBTQ plus community. You are welcome and safe in New Jersey. Signing an executive order protecting gender affirming health care, directing all state departments to ensure transgender and non-binary adults and minors have equal access to services regardless of how they identify. As senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, it's welcome news for the community as other states begin restricting those same rights. We know that families across the country are being made into political refugees because of the actions their state governments are taking. So mom Jamie Bruzehoff cheers Governor Murphy's decision to sign an executive order making New Jersey a safe haven for transgender folks. The order protects people who seek or provide gender affirming health care in New Jersey, even if they've traveled here from a growing number of Republican controlled states where it's banned. For the Bruzehoff family and their trans teen Rebecca, it offers sanctuary. She knows that her state has taken a stand and is a safe place for her friends and peers across the country, and that at the highest level here in New Jersey, she has support. And in a time when things are so bad and contentious and transgender kids are under attack every day, that's huge. You are backed by the government that is saying, you can come here, you will still have the same treatment, you can still have affirming health care, you can still be yourself and be safe and also if your states send for you, you will still be safe here. Activist Brielle winslow Majet notes Jersey's home to some 30,000 transgender and non-binary residents. Murphy's order offers specific protection, shielding adults and minors, including healthcare professionals, involved in gender-affirming health care. It also bars New Jersey departments and agencies from cooperating with subpoenas or extradition targeting transgender patients from other states. It is something that's personal. It is something that's targeted. Activist Tatiana Furman says the Murphy order will offer refuge to people struggling in states with anti-trans laws, especially transgender and non-binary youth. Because it is real. We are out here. Um, it, it is not going to stop happening. Transgender kids are being born every day. In a tweet, Murphy stated the order establishes New Jersey as a safe haven for gender-affirming health care. New Jersey's Republican Assembly trolled it with this tweet, noting the order protects doctors who provide hormone replacement drugs and surgery on children. It's linked to one doctor's article arguing pediatric trans treatments overprescribed and needs clearer protocols. But Bruzehoff argues the guidelines are are clear and none of them include doing surgery on children that's just not happening so for politicians to get in the way of care that is um, deemed appropriate by every major medical organization and that is really between a doctor and a patient and their family is is horrifying what if we decided that politicians know more about medicine than actual doctors it's Volatile Politics, a new state website offering transgender information, drew fire from some Ocean County Republican legislators because it's paid for with pandemic relief funds. Murphy himself admits as he's signing the order. I, I can't say it's the law of the land because it isn't. The governor signed the executive order because a transgender safe haven bill introduced earlier this year is still languishing in the legislature, where all 120 seats are up for election in November. It's become a highly politicized issue. And so there is a lot of districts in New Jersey that are worried about passing pro-trans 
legislation at a time when voters are getting fed a lot of misinformation. And so we're super grateful to the Murphy administration for stepping up to ensure that we don't have to wait until after November to get this type of legislation done. To know that New Jersey is a safe place for them and that we have these protections in place is huge. I'm Brenda Flanagan and J Spotlight News. In our spotlight on business report, the Port Authority is looking to the future with a little help from NASA. The bi-state agency announced yesterday it would partner with the Federal Space Authority to plan the future of the region's airspace. The skies are, of course, going to get increasingly crowded as technologies like drone delivery move forward. The partnership will explore transportation possibilities available through new aircraft that take off and land vertically, along with preparing for the infrastructure needs that will be there with electric flight. Port Authority leaders say the new partnership will keep the agency and the region on the cutting edge of technology and policy. Well, there's help tonight for people in the state facing water shutoffs. Governor Murphy this week signed a bill preventing water and sewer utilities from turning off service to customers with overdue bills before October 1st. It applies to water companies that didn't participate in New Jersey's low-income water assistance program, which is meant to help customers who got behind on payments during the pandemic. Specifically, those local and public utilities won't be able to enforce liens, charge interest on overdue amounts, or discontinue service. Statewide data shows households owe about $45 million in overdue water bills, but less than a quarter of New Jersey's 600 utilities agreed to participate in the program that distributes federal aid. We still don't have the latest numbers on the amount of debt the state government racked up last year, but early figures show progress is being made in key areas. It's a welcome sign for one of the most indebted states in the nation, but will it last? Budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer is here now to share the details. Well, John, debt has been among top concern uh, for state lawmakers uh, for years. Tell us the good news, though, that we're getting out of uh, the budget hearings this week. Yeah, that, that's right, Brown. And it was around this time last year that we were reporting on a big spike in debt, both bonded debt and non what's known as non-bonded debt, which is, you know, namely what New Jersey owes retired workers in terms of pension benefits and, and health care. And after that big spike last year, we've sort of been keeping an eye on what's been going on. The state has budgeted a, another full employer pension contribution and also taken measures to retire debt. And as of the end of the last fiscal year, the, the latest figures that we have do show improvement on both sides of that debt ledger. And so it's almost as if, you know, you got a report from your doctor asking you maybe to exercise more or change your diet to improve your blood pressure. And then you come back from a checkup and you find that your blood pressure is going down. And so and, and we, we wouldn't be surprised to see some of this improvement, but it is nice to see the state do some things to address to address its debt load and that start to show up in the financial documents. So the treasurer's office, the Murphy administration, I'm sure, is pointing to this saying, look, what we're doing is working. What's really enabled them, though, to make these payments and to get these numbers down? Yeah, and we should be clear that New Jersey, despite some of this incremental progress, still has a really big level of bonded debt and a large unfunded pension liability. And that built up over years of shorting the annual pension contributions and also racking up a lot of bonded debt instead of maybe funding things more on a pay-as-you-go basis. But in recent budget hearings, the administration has pointed to both an effort to retire debt early, something known as defeasance, but also generally trying to issue less bonded debt than the state takes on each year. And so that's basically kind of paying off your credit card bill at a higher rate than your state buying things on your credit card. And so that's what's being pointed to, to, to help address the bonded debt. And then on the pension side of this, it's really this commitment that's gonna be three years running under the budget the governor's proposed for the fiscal year that begins July 1 of just paying the pension bills making what actuaries would consider to be full pension contributions. And that comes after years of the state, including during the early years of the Murphy administration, when things were starting to ramp up, 
but of the state not paying its full employer pension contributions. And so that racked up a lot of debt on the backside of, yeah. of that policy. All right, well, I'll echo what we've been hearing from Republicans. Is it sustainable, though, for the state? I mean, have they made real structural changes in the budget to make sure they can continue paying their uh, bills uh, and their debt in this way? Yeah, and that's a really good point to bring up. The improvement has all occurred during a big surge in revenue that we've seen. You know, the federal government responded very robustly to the COVID-19 pandemic, and that helped in terms of generating a lot of tax revenue for New Jersey. Now that we're maybe entering into a period where we could see economic growth slow, that will be the big test for this new uh, these, these new measures to address debt. All right. John Reitmeyer, always uh, helping us to make sense of these complex issues. We appreciate it. You're welcome. And here's how stocks wrapped up for this short trading week. And finally, a reminder that if you see it, you can be it. Despite the rising number of women entering medical professions, surgical specialties are still largely male-dominated. That gender gap is widest in the neurosurgery field. But at JFK Medical Center in Edison, female neurosurgeons are inspiring other young women to walk the same path. Raven Santana has the story. You shouldn't do this if you want to have a family. It's a seven-year residency. You know, you, you want to have kids someday, and this is not really conducive to that. Dr. Yevgenia Schechtman, Director of Education at JFK University Medical Center's Neuroscience Institute, knows firsthand what it feels like to be counted out because she's a woman. The neurosurgeon who was born in Russia moved to the U.S. when she was eight. She went to Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri for medical school and then NYU for residency. Dr. Schechtman says she always wanted to be a neurosurgeon and wanted to create a path for other women. She chose not to listen to the naysayers and went on to have three children and pursue a career she loves. I had two of them in residency during my two chief years. And then I had my littlest one, um, you know, as an attending. Traditionally, women are underrepresented in fields uh, such as surgery, neurosurgery in particular. So there are 300 um, or so female board certified neurosurgeons in the U.S. and about 3,000 or, th uh, or so males. Uh, so I think it's really important that we're not missing out on the talent. I think what makes it hard is just that, you know, the idea that you can juggle your family and your career. In my training, we had one female attending out of 22. Uh, so didn't necessarily have kind of that role model, uh, but I think that's changing as more of my co-residents were female and now here at JFK we have three female neurosurgeons out of the six of us. Dr. Schechtman says in addition to diversity, having more women in the neurosurgeon fields can also impact patients in a number of ways. I feel like sometimes female patients prefer a female doctor. Um, oftentimes it can be for religious reasons. For example, I have uh, some Muslim patients who just prefer a female surgeon uh, for modesty reasons. Uh, so there's definitely an element of that and if those patients feel more comfortable. Each language has its own uh, flavor to it and has its own cultural nuances. And when you are able to speak that patient's language, you're able to connect with them at a completely different level. Harsimran Panasar is a fourth year medical student. The 27 year old was born in India and is a first generation American, first generation college student, and the first one in her family to become a physician. She is also the founder and president of Women in Surgery organization at a medical school and says it's important to have a place for female doctors to lean on each other. When I was telling my um, other attendings or uh, doctors that I want to be a surgeon, they would look at me like, oh, you don't have that personality. You're so sweet and bubbly. You're not going to be able to hold up to the grit of what it requires to be a surgeon. And um, when I was finally in my surgery clerkship, I was able to meet more mentors in surgery. They were able to show me how strong and resilient they were. I definitely encountered on several occasions people uh, mostly other trainees, other residents um, in the field basically being like, 
surgery with women in it? No, no, that's not a thing. Surgery really went downhill when we started taking women in. So, um, and that was a, a frequent sentiment I would hear. Neurosurgeon Dr. Asha Iyer is a California girl born and bred. She says she always wanted to be a neurosurgeon. She credits female mentorship for reaching her goals. And Dr. Iyer says representation is critical when it comes to more women feeling confident about becoming neurosurgeons. I think it's very exciting for them. And um, and then to hear a little bit of our personal stories and say, yes, and they have a family, they have this. We can, you know, I think it's, it makes their dreams a lot more tangible and attainable. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. And that's our show tonight. But a reminder, you can now listen to NJ Spotlight News anytime via podcast. So make sure you download it and check us out. For now, I'm Brianna Venozzi. On behalf of the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy. Jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.